Okay, good to see each and every one out, and we join with Brian. Welcoming you out. Hope you get your Bibles, follow along as we study. We'll be looking at a whole lot of passages, but uh, anyway, it'd be easy for you to follow along. We're going to begin here in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. The text says, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So Paul addresses this local congregation, and it also points out the uh, divine order of how a congregation that is fully, uh, fully organized, according to New Testament pattern, a local congregation. You'll have bishops in the congregation, you'll have deacons in the congregation, and of course the saints that make up the congregation. So there you have the whole flock and uh, uh, the, the ones that uh, lead, and, and particular functions there, the bishops and deacons. And, of course, uh, tonight uh, we're going to talk about deacons in the local church and uh, study about that and be pondering about that because that's something that we have need of is the appointment of deacons. And so that's what we're going to study about is talk about deacons. Uh, we're going to go over to the book of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 8 through 13. And hope you'll follow along as we kind of delve in, thinking about qualifications of those who might be willing to serve as deacons. And there are qualifications, not just anybody, it's not just randomly, that if you happen to have qualifications, that's fine. And if you don't, well, we can still point you as deacons. It's not like that. Uh, because it talks about, in our text, it talks about, uh, uh, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife ruling their own children, and their own house as well. It's kind of like a fellow one time I was in Louisville several years ago. And anyway, I uh, hadn't seen him for a while. And not a few years. And, and we got talking. And he said, oh, where are you at? I said, well, I, I live down in Horse Cave. I said, I've got, got involved. I was converted and involved in preaching the gospel. Oh, well, that's great. He said, yeah. He said, I, 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 go to the, I go to the Baptist church. And, and he said, in fact, I, I'm one of the deacons there. And I said, oh, well, how, how's your wife and children doing? He said, well, I, I'm married, but I don't have kids. And I said, well, what does that mean over there in 1 Timothy chapter 3? It says, uh, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. And he said, well, we take that to mean that if they have children. <laughs> I don't think it said, if you have children, rule them well. That's not what he said. Ruling. Uh, their, uh, their children and their own house as well. Well, anyway, so well, I hadn't thought about that. So, so it's not a bunch of if you have these qualifications. Uh, it's like, uh, well, if you don't, that, that's okay. They're, they're not really necessary. No, that, they are qualifications and they are necessary things that are talked about in our text here. And so uh, that's what we're going to talk about this passage. And when we talk about the qualification, really most of the things that it talks about of those who would serve as deacons, the qualifications, really are things that all of us should be striving for. Whether you want to talk about being dignified or grave, uh, not to be given to wine, or you want to talk about uh, ruling your children well, you want, you, you know, if, if you're married. Now, you don't have to be married, you don't have to have kids in order to be a Christian, but really a lot of these qualities is the same uh, as we talked about and study about of those who would be bishops in a congregation. I mean, there are qualities really that we all strive for uh, just simply as a Christian and as people that have, uh, have developed these qualities and manifest in these qualities and have worked on that in their lives, not being double-tongued, and et cetera, and all the things that we see. Uh, so uh, really, there, really a lot of things we talk about is things all of us should be concerned about in our lives as children of God, whether you would ever serve as an, uh, an overseer or whether you serve as a deacon. All right. And so uh, we'll begin there in verse 8, and he says, Likewise must the deacons be grave, etc. Not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of dishonest gain. First of all, let's just define the term deacon, Mr. There, it just says, one who executes the commands of another, especially of a master. That is, we'd be talking about a servant, an attendant, a minister. And sometimes even the word uh, diakonos is even translated, translated that way, simply the idea of ministering or serving. 
And so, but this is a special office. Now, uh, are, are we all to be servants? Well, yeah, in general, all Christians should serve. That, that's true. But this is talking about a particular office in the congregation as, uh, as we're looking at the text here. And uh, anyway, so not talking about just serving in general, which we should, should all try to be servants, but talking about a specific office. All right, so likewise must the deacons, and then he begins talking about the various quality characteristics, and it's not trying to slam on anybody that doesn't have these qualities and characteristics, it's just that these are things that, that God saw fit. It's kind of like, you know, an airplane, you know, you have a lot of people ride an airplane, but you just don't want, anybody and everybody up there in the cockpit. You want somebody that qualified to drive an airplane up in the cockpit. And I guess if there's an emergency, I guess you might try to get anybody that's as close, maybe practicing, uh, maybe even training, but uh, we're, we're not talking about that situation. Uh, but generally you want people that are well qualified to be in the cockpit flying a plane. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at these qualifications. Likewise, must the deacons be grave. Other translation just simply says uh, dignified or reverent. That is, one who respects the Lord, one who respects right, one who loves God and, and being respectful of that which is right, trying to live a dignified life and uh, not that uh, life is a flip and everything's a big joke. Uh, talking about somehow it's wrong to be, uh, you know, kid around and, and have humor in your life but to be dignified and serious about, you know, the things of God, etc., and, and uh, serving God. Then it says not double tongue. Uh, the Indian saying was, well, he speaks with a forked tongue. And this ideal double tongue literally is ideal di logos, a word, that is we speak words, and di meaning two, speaking two words. Uh, we say one thing in this situation, and then over here in a different situation, we say something totally different which uh, would be really just paramount uh, lying, just not telling the truth. Now, don't, you don't be double-tongued. You, you just be who you are and be that in all times and situations. Be, uh, always speak the truth. Then it says not given to much wine. That is not uh, addicted to wine, under the influence of wine, not deceived by wine. It reminds you of Proverbs chapter 20. Uh, wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You want know, somebody that's been deceived and misled by wine because it can be pretty deceptive. It's like one of the prophets says that wine and new wine and whoredom taketh away the heart. When people uh, get under the influence of alcohol or passions, it can take away the heart and people do crazy things. All right. And then he goes on to say, not greedy of dishonest gain or filthy lucre. Uh, the King James would say, the old King James would say, that is dirty money, <clears throat> uh, being dishonest and, uh, you know, uh, doing things to, uh, for the sake of money that's not honorable and right. No, don't, don't be uh, greedy of dishonest gain. Uh, live honorably. And then he goes on in verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith. Well, what's the mystery of the faith? Well, Jew and Gentile reconciled in the one body. It's the mystery of the gospel. Paul talked about it at length there in the book of Ephesians chapter 3. The great mystery of how God could reconcile Jew and Gentile and both be reconciled in the one body, breaking down the middle wall of partition. And that was just, just an awesome plan. And so holding the mystery of the faith, that is understand the gospel message and holding to it in a pure conscience, that is accept the gospel, believe the gospel, and holding to, <coughs> excuse me, holding to the old paths and uh, uh, with a pure conscience, that is living a sincere, genuine life, a quality and characteristic uh, needed uh, to serve in this capacity. And then it can, continues on then in verse 10, and let these also be first tested or proved. Well, what, what do we learn from that? Well, you know, we need to be proved. That is kind of like in different seasons, different situations. You know, sometimes you have, you can have people that 
Well, maybe when there's not a lot going on, okay, kind of show up and doing pretty good. But then maybe they have some hobbies, summer hobbies, sports, and they're gone most of the time. Or gone a lot of the time. And, you know, for really no good excuse. And, well, in the season, off season, okay, seem to be proven, tested. I want to be a reliable person. But in another season, you know, well, they're not... Uh, not so so. So let these also be proved. So we need to be tested under different situations. And how do how do how do people act? Are they try to be the same? Try to be faithful and reliable in all situations? Well, let them be tested and to observe. So it's not going to be somebody that obeys the gospel one day and you know next week they're ready to be appointed. Uh, doesn't seem to be that. Need to be tested. So it implies some period of time to observe the life that they're setting the good example. Then let them use the office, that is, not just merely a title, but an office, a function, uh, to be a special servant of the church as a deacon. Uh, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. That is, they're not going to be criticized because, ah, uh, you know, they, I don't know, they, 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 on, uh, they do things, uh, I don't know, a little shady and blah, 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 and, and do things that are just uh, just not right. Uh, don't, don't need somebody like that. Uh, need to be honorable uh, in, within and without. Uh, be found blameless, he talks about. All right. Then moving to verse 11. Now this is kind of an interesting, as it talks about the wise, even so must their wise be serious, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Now, some have taken various positions. Some say... Well, is this just talking about only the wives of deacons? Well, then that would raise the question, well, what about the wives of overseers that he talked about earlier in the chapter? Uh, only the wives of deacons have to be uh, serious, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things? Or is he saying the wives of these offices? It seems to me that's what he's talking about. And some may even take the position, well, it's talking about female deaconesses which I don't know that mm, kind of uh, don't know that we actually find that in the scriptures uh, some try to allude to uh, Phoebe in the book of Romans and try to say that she was a female deacon but we don't find that because uh, well, there's several assumptions made there and plus you have the principle of of the role of subordination that is talked about, functional subordination that is described in the New Testament, that you might run into conflicts there. So I don't think he's talking about that. But I think really what he's talking about really implies that both overseers and deacons need good wives. That would be required to have a good wife. Even so must their wives, that is, of the deacons and of the overseers, to have good wives. We have the old saying, behind every good man is a good woman. Uh, there's a lot of truth to that. That, that, that is just so. And really, uh, you know, God chose married people. Uh, you know, what, what's interesting about that is that e even in society, uh, a young single person can be very, can be very um, accountable and act right and do the right thing. And, but when you get married, there just seems to be, you know, statistically, uh, sometimes single people do things a little bit more out on the fringe as opposed to when you get married. And especially when you have kids, you, you make more wiser decisions after you get married, especially after you get kids. You just look at things a whole lot different. It's like uh, <clears throat> when, of course, when I, was, I was fairly young, I was 21, and so when I obeyed the gospel and, you know, had my own car, you know, insurance was pretty expensive. I mean, I tried to be a careful driver. I tried to, I didn't want to go out and do uh, crazy things because insurance was expensive enough. But, you know, when Kathy and I were getting planned to get married, so I called insurance and it's like, yeah, well, my wife, she, she, had, a, she, had, a, she had an older car and in my car and there's going to be two drivers. And like my insurance went way down. And I thought, man, if I'd known that, I got married a lot sooner. <laughs> oh, and and why, why? Well, just getting married, people just settle down. They don't do so many 
crazy things that young single people do. I'm not saying all, all single people do crazy things, but just statistically. I mean, it's just, it's just the facts. But yeah, my insurance went way down. Uh, but anyway, and then there's the way, way less for both of us and two cars than just myself as a, a, single, yet, a single young male. <clears throat> and, well, I'm talking about that, young single girls are cheaper than young single males. That's, and again, it's based on statistics, uh, statistically. And so, you know, I mean, that's just the way it is. So, but God saw that married people and married people with kids there are lots of lessons that you learn that you don't really fully realize when you're single and by yourself. It's just, I, I don't know. It's just So God in his wisdom for those who would serve as overseers and those who serve deacons, that they're married with kids. And it seems like, even people of the world see that. They, they talk about that idea. And, you know, that when you have kids, you just look at things a little bit different in life, uh, especially... Uh, you know, when you have kids, uh, even married as opposed to being single. So, even so must their wives be serious or grave or dignified. Same word, talking about the, uh, the deacons up there in verse 8. Be serious. That is serious about the gospel. I'm not saying that you have to be, you know, so serious and, and you never crack a smile about it. That, that's not what he's talking about. You know, we can be serious about the gospel. Doesn't mean we have to take ourselves too seriously, but we need to take the gospel seriously. We need to take life seriously. And, you know, you can't have some levity and, and uh, humor in your life, but always the work of, work of the gospel is serious. <clears throat> so, even so must their wives be serious, not slanderers, that is, telling tales, being running people down, don't need to be slandering. But again, that goes for all of us. We don't need to be out slandering anybody. And slander always. I mean, even it could be, it could be even something that's true. You talk about something that's true, but slander always has an evil intention. There's malice involved in it. And you got a couple examples, like in the book of Daniel, where they slander, gave an evil report about Daniel. You know, praying to another god there in Daniel chapter six. Well, was that true? Well, yeah. But it was slander because they had a, a malicious intent of what they were reporting to the king. They, they, they were bent on hurting Daniel. What they said was the actual truth. Was he praying to another guy? Yeah, he prayed to another guy. What they said was true. But often when people slander, they have evil intent. Maybe they can't find something that's true, so then they just make up something. And lots of times slander is something that's just really false. It's just sort of a false assumption or, or um, what's the phrase in First Timothy chapter 6, uh, putting evil intent upon that, uh, on something that people are doing. No, we, we don't need to do that. We need to be honorable and to, to say the right thing. Uh, let me look at that phrase. It was there in First Timothy chapter 6, uh, evil surmising, that was the phrase. Evil surmising is that you look at a situation and you put a bad light about it. And that could be the interpretation, but we do that with malice intent. And that evil surmising is not bad, uh, is, is bad. Because in, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love demands that we think no evil. We look at the situation and we're going to put the best, we're going to have love and be charitable and always try to put the best uh, spin on it, the best explanation. And that's, the way, that's what love would demand, not evil surmise. And we can't evil surmise. That, and that can be easy to do. We just look at, look at it and maybe we don't have all the facts and we put kind of a twist on it and make it look bad. Well, we could look at it a different way and that would be a perfectly legitimate explanation, and that would be the good, uh, the good way to look at it. And so, by charity and by love, we'll, we'll just put the best, we'll put the best uh, view on it, until evidence would demand otherwise that now yeah, it really was bad. 
So slander, that is tail-bearing and, and malicious intent and whispering and backbiting and all that. Uh, all those words are very similar. Uh, tempering, uh, exercising self-control, that's something all of us uh, have to be practicing and certainly for the wives of deacons and overseers. Faithful in all things, and that, and that, and that the general exhortation for all Christians. Be thou faithful unto death. I mean, reliable, dependable. That's the word faithful. And that's the point. Uh, so we're talking about wives who are going to be supported. Uh, supportive of their husbands and the work that they're doing as deacons or as overseers. Then in number 12, he says, Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. Same as we talk about overseers or bishops in the congregation. Husbands of one wife. And, uh, of course, if your spouse dies and you marry again, you're still the husband of one wife. You might have had two wives, but you're just the husband of one wife because the first one died. And so let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, uh, a married man, because, again, e even the world knows that people are much more sensible as opposed to, even though there, there are a lot of good single, level-headed people, but the God just says, let them be a married man, husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. That is, they're trying to oversee and look, watch out and manage. That, that's that of ruling is managing and watching out and directing the affairs of their children. Now, this is something different from the overseer because the overseer, the bishop, they have believing children. So that would be children old enough to obey the gospel. So these could be small children. So you see that a lot of times in your congregation. It will be younger men who may have smaller children, uh, not of the age of accountability, serve in the capacity of deacons. And you'll see that lots of times in congregation where uh, a younger man that's married and have children, level-headed, a good person, good wife, good family man, young man, and will serve as deacons, and then their kids grow up, and they develop uh, the other qualities about overseers, of being teaching, and their children become Christian, and then they then become overseers. And you see that quite often happen in various congregations around about as you look through history. But a good family man, as it describes there. <clears throat> then in verse 13, he goes on to say, for they, have, for they that have used the office... And again, not just merely a title, but a work. And that's, that's the idea of the office, is a work. For they that have used the office, or the work, or the service of a deacon, well gain for themselves a good standing. That is, that they are standing upright, uh, counted as, as good, faithful men, solid men, and uh, well recognized, of good reputation uh, within the congregation and uh, in their work of being willing to serve in, in these capacities uh, as a deacon, as a special servant of the church. And so they uh, gain for themselves a good standing and great boldness, it talks about, in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, just a fine, upstanding member of the congregation in the work that they're doing as the deacon. Now, one notice also over in the book of Acts chapter 6. Now, Acts chapter 6 doesn't say deacons, but definitely there are some principles here. I personally think it's talking about deacons, but it certainly would go as we look at this text in the book of Acts chapter 6, uh, and there are principles here that certainly would help us in, in, this, in this concept. Because when the, the question come about the, uh, the, the, the Grecian widows and the Hebrew widows and the Grecian widows were being ne neglected and that there was some care need to be done and there was some distension and problems and murmuring that was going on and that, that comes to the attention of the apostles to the twelve and so they say it's not reasonable there in verse 2 then the twelve called the multitude of disciples gather up all the congregation called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reasonable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now, they're not saying, you know, we're just too proud to do this lowly work of serving tables. That, that's, that's not the issue. The issue is, 
The apostles had a work that they could do that other people, other people couldn't do. That is, they were working in, in teaching and, and making known the mind of God through inspiration and in the work that they were doing. Not everybody could do that. And so they didn't need to leave that and serve tables when other people could do that. Again, it's kind of like if we go back to the analogy of an airplane. I mean, I mean you have stewardess and and attendance, you know, helping in the flight, etc. you know, helping with getting people sit, seated down, everybody's got their seat belts on, and doing all these different things they're doing, you know, uh, cross-check on the doors and all those types of things. Well, there's other people that may not have the qual uh, qualifications to fly an airplane, but they've been trained to do those jobs, but not everybody can be doing the job. So there are a lot more people that can be flight attendants than there are going to be pilots because it's a more uh, highly qualified, more specified work. And that, that's really what the apostles are saying. It's not that, you know, we're, just, we're, just, we're too good. No, they're, no that, that's, not, that's not the point. They, they shouldn't leave the word of the Lord, the word of God, and serve tables. Various people could be doing that because they had something that, that only they could be doing, uh, particularly here, especially in the early church, and that is in teaching the gospel. So, verse 3, Therefore, brethren, pick out from among you seven men of honor and report, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. That is this work. That is, serving these tables, doing the job that needed to be done uh, in the local congregation there. And again, that would be the idea of a deacon serving in this capacity, uh, more of a physical type things that need to be done uh, in, in the a local congregation with the brethren and et cetera there. And in contrast to a more specialized work of uh, like the apostles had as opposed uh, uh, to the deacons or what they might be able to do to appoint to this, this business here <clears throat> that he talks about. And if they were deacons, certainly the same kind of qualities that Paul's talking about, somebody that's full of the Holy Spirit, uh, somebody that has wisdom, somebody that has an honest report. You want good, solid people. You just don't want anybody. Just grab somebody and say, hey, you, you be one of the deacons. Hey, you, you just be a deacon. No, uh, you want good, solid people that are willing and ready to serve. And deacons being special servants <clears throat> is that they know that they're, they're volunteering, that they're, they're going to be willing to help. It's not going to be not going to be asked, are you willing to help? It's only if, you know, can you do this? I mean, sometimes their obligations come up and the opportunity is not there because they have other obligations. Maybe, maybe you got sick kids, maybe you got a sick parent, maybe you got a wife that's sick. And so it's not that they're not willing to serve. It's just, well, they got other obligations. Other than that, sure, they'd be willing to serve. They're ready to do that. that, that that's the whole point of being appointed to be a deacon is like, well, we've got to find people that are willing to serve. Well, when you become a deacon, you're just saying, hey, I'm willing to serve. Now, there may be things that you couldn't because other obligations come up, and that sometimes happens, but you're not find, trying to find people that are willing to serve on a voluntary basis because they've been appointed, and they're just saying, hey, I'm always willing to serve, assuming that you know there's not something else that, that's taking precedent, like a sick kid or you know, an elderly parent or a spouse that's sick, and that, and et cetera. All right. So he goes on to say in verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So, so the apostles, they were busy doing this, and there were a lot of people that could fill in serving things. I'm not saying the pastor, well, we're just too good. You, you know, we're, we're, uh, you know we're, we're proud. No, it's not, not everybody could be serving in the capacity that they were doing, but there will be more that could serve in this capacity, and so we'll appoint people. So that's, uh, uh, you know, kind of the concept. And when you look at all those qualifications of 1 Timothy chapter 3, it would be very similar to this list here of just good, solid, spiritual, dedicated Christians who are going to be willing and ready to serve. Now, how are they chosen? And that's the principle of verse 3. Therefore, brethren, pick out from among yourselves. Look out from among yourselves. That is the congregation to look around. And that's, that's, uh, we use that principle when, when the, the, we were talking about uh, appointing overseers. 
everybody was to kind of look around and think about people who might be qualified. We'd look at all the qualifications, and then you look at the men that might serve as overseers, and that uh, from within, and that's the principle that, that the apostles gave here, was for from among yourselves, they were to choose and men that would meet these qualifications and to communicate and talk with them about would they be willing to serve in this capacity. And so, again, the same thing would be about deacons. Look from among ourselves, that we sort of look among ourselves and think about various men, a good solid men that have wives and children that are solid in the gospel and see if they would be willing to serve in the capacity. And it's from this principle here in verse 3. And so there, there's a difference in, in the work of, of like the apostles and, and these seven that serve or the overseers or bishops and deacons that First Timothy and Philippians chapter 1, it, just kind of this difference in, in uh, work there. And using the same pattern like we did in choosing and selecting overseers is to look out for among yourselves. And, and that's something all of us to think about and to pray about, study about, looking at these qualifications here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and these biblical concepts and look at the different men and then to talk about, well, think about, uh, study about, pray about, and then say, hey, Brother so-and-so, would, 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 would you even think about being one of the deacons in the, in the congregation? And, well, yeah, that, yeah, I think I would be willing to do that. And maybe we'll get one of the, we'll, we'll try to get those one of those papers made up for next week is kind of be thinking about praying about it and then kind of begin talking to some people and uh, like brother so and so would you be willing and of course that's going to involve their family because you know because <laughs> you're talking about a family man so you're going to have wives that need to be supportive about that and uh, etc and so a decision to take on this responsibility and so anyway, just like we did about the overseers, is to suggest names, talk with them. Uh, well, I've talked with Brother So-and-so, and they'd be interested and willing to serve. And then again, uh, you know, then to set forth the one that would be willing before the congregation. And then to say, are there objections? And again, kind of like we did before, well, do you have an objection? You need to be able to to. to to say what the objection is and give a scripture why you object and be able to sign your name to it. Not just, to, you know, it's easy. Complain is easy. You know, anybody can complain. But to really think it out and thought it through that you'd be willing to write it down, that you've, you've thought about why this person wouldn't be a good candidate to serve in the office of a deacon and be able to give a scripture, the, the objection, and to then be able to sign your name to it, own up to it. And so it puts kind of a different light that instead of just carping and griping, because that's, that's pretty easy to do. Anybody can do that. Uh, but uh, so that's, uh, that's the ideal. And so qualifications of deacons. And again, all of us need to be thinking about it and praying about it and studying about it and examining. And the exhortation of the apostles, look out from among yourselves. If they could do it in the first century, we do the same thing. We have biblical principles. Even if, if, if that wasn't deacons there in Acts chapter 6, certainly a good principle that applies, uh, look out for among yourselves. That's, that's a good scriptural way to do it. All right, so that's our study. If you've got any questions, I'd be always to look at them. And uh, anyway, something for all of us to be thinking and studying about. Well, we shift gears now, talk about the plan of salvation. We do that regular at each service. The plan of salvation is... To hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You gotta, gotta hear this good news. The good news that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And then we gotta believe that, yeah, he died, and he was buried, and he arose from the dead. Yeah, we, we gotta believe all that. The death, burial, and resurrection. That Jesus is the Son of God. And then Jesus tells us to repent, and that means that we're turning from sin and we're turning to God, and that we've got to confess. Our faith before man, that's what the eunuch did. He said, yeah, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He, he openly acknowledged before others. And then to be baptized for forgiveness. And now why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. And, yeah, that's part of the plan of salvation. It's not my ideal, 
Baptism is not my think so. It's just what the scripture says. And that's just one of many passages that talk about that. Come out of that watery grave. Be faithful in death. Revelation 2 and verse 10. That is be reliable, dependable as a servant of the Lord. And if you're a Christian by the, uh, by the wayside, we air, repent and pray. As we see there from Acts chapter 8 and verse 22. We're going to sing this song to your encouragement. Zion's call. God, Zion's call is going out. If you need to hear the call of the gospel, need to respond. Anyway, and we can help. You come and let us know why together as we stand and as we sing. <laughs>